So welcome everyone to part three of Vermont Cyanobacteria Training for Citizen Volunteers. I'm Angela Shambaugh with the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation Lakes and Ponds Program, and I'm providing the training for you today. As a volunteer, you should have already watched part one and part two, especially if you're a new volunteer. Um, they will explain some general cyanobacteria ecology to you, as well as um, cover the visual assessment program. So let's get started. Uh, before we dive into the database and loading your report to the through the internet, let's talk about monitoring uh, during COVID. Your health and safety is very important to us, so please um, make sure that you're practicing health and safety guidelines to protect yourself and to protect others. If you're monitoring at a public site, please be sure to follow all posted COVID guidance there. Most of it will be about social distancing, but uh, some areas may be closed to public access because of COVID. And if that is the case, please respect that request and do not monitor there. Go back when that site is open again. If you're coming in from out of state or if you left the state and are returning after a vacation, please make sure to follow the current guidelines regarding quarantine. You can see the link to the Vermont Department of Health's webpage there below the image. Um, when you come back, consult that. Uh, things are changing as we open up um, and may change again if we experience um, a higher number of, ex higher than expected number of cases. So when you come back, uh, check that website for information on how you should be quarantining. Don't monitor if you're feeling sick. Uh, stay home and take care of yourself. Wear a mask at a public location and practice social distancing in public spaces. Some of you are monitoring from home and you would, you would follow the guidance that you've been doing at home. But if you are out in a public space, please follow the governor's guidance with respect to how uh, you should be behaving and, and about wearing a mask. Stay safe this summer, and we hope that uh, all of you will have a good summer and not have to worry about being sick. Of course, there are health and safety things that we need to be concerned about with respect to cyanobacteria. Uh, health effects from cyanobacteria exposure are rarely reported in Vermont, but they do occur. Um, we want you to be sure to avoid physical contact with cyanobacteria um, unless you're collecting your sample. When you're collecting a sample, wear gloves. Uh, you may choose to wear boots when you're sampling. Wash your hands when you're finished. Be sure to keep your samples away from children and pets. And if your kids and pets follow you down to the beach, make sure that they're safe down there too and not coming in contact with cyanobacteria. Probably goes without saying, but don't store your samples in your fridge. Um, unless you're sending a sample to us in the mail, most, most samples don't need to be refrigerated. They can just be kept someplace cool. You can develop sensitivity over time. I do know of at least one person that has done that. Uh, it got to the point where she began to have asthma-like symptoms before she even saw cyanobacteria if there were a lot of them present. If you suspect you're developing this sensitivity, please do stop monitoring. Again, your health is more important than that data point, um, and we would encourage you to find other ways to volunteer um, and avoid the cyanobacteria monitoring. All right, with that, let's talk about uploading data. Thanks to the Vermont Department of Health IT folks, we have a brand new website for you to try out this summer. Uh, you can see the address there in green above the image. I'll also send that address along with your login credentials uh, a little bit later once you've let me know that you're going to continue to monitor. This year, our uh, interface should be available on mobile devices because um, because it's brand new and it's had very little testing by, by folks other than the IT staff, um, you'll have to try it out on your device and see how well it works. You do have issues uploading information to the tracker. Um, take screenshots, um, give us as much information you can about what you experienced, and then we can send that to the health department so that they can troubleshoot. All right, so when you click on, when you open the web page, you'll see here two different ways to submit reports. The first is submit a routine report. The second is submit a report at a non-routine location. A routine report is one of those where you are that you are taking at the site you've chosen to monitor each week. Um, you'll, that's your routine location and you will submit all reports from that location through this first the interface uh, uh, from this first option. 
any other location, one where you don't monitor frequently, one where you happen to be visiting just by chance. Uh, we will also use this one for reports that are emailed to us by the general public on the Department of Health's webpage. Um, all of those are considered non-routine locations, and you will use that second login uh, check-in option to submit a Bloom report for those. All right, so let's assume you've clicked now uh, on submitting a routine report. You'll see the image on the left. You'll see that uh, view that when you, oh my goodness, you'll see that view when you click on the page. Um, it gives you opportunity to enter specific information. And then as you can see at the bottom, uh, you'll be selecting your location and checking where it is and verifying it on the map. So starting with the site name, you'll select from a drop-down menu. We're using a drop-down menu, and yes, I know it's a very long one, um, but we're using a drop-down menu because it minimizes the spelling mistakes and the, and the typing, um, the creative typing that happens sometimes during the summer, uh, because that makes it very difficult to sort a database and find the records that you're looking for. Just an extra space uh, at the end of a line um, can change how that name appears in our database. So we're using the drop-down menu. You should be able to type in your, your site number and uh, get where you're trying to go uh, very quickly. Next, you'll put in the date. Um, we're using the calendar icon to get you started. So click there. You'll see the calendar pop up. Click on the day. Then you'll need to put in the time. Uh, so you can see circled in blue there and also with an arrow pointing at it. Uh, at the bottom of the calendar is a clock icon. Select that icon, click on it, and then um, you will see the clock interface pop up. Use the up and down arrows to select the time of day, and then be sure to also put AM or PM. And at that point, you will have the date and time entered into the spreadsheet. So the remaining information uh, covers who you are, um, who you're associated with. You'll see a place for your name, for your affiliation. Affiliation. Again, it's a drop-down menu. If you don't see your affiliation there, you should have the option to select Other. Then select the report type. Uh, we will populate it automatically with Routine Weekly. Um, and again, that is the first report that you are making at this location uh, each week. If you have the time to go back um, later in the week, you make a second report, or if there's been a bloom and you are following your report by re uh, providing information every 24 hours, when you click on the drop-down menu, you see the, op the option for supplemental reports. And supplemental reports cover all of those, uh, except for your very first one each week. So the very first report each week at your routine location is considered your routine report. Anything else in addition to that is supplemental. Next comes uh, some information about the water itself. If you have a thermometer, water temperature would be a great piece of information to have, but if you don't have it, you can leave it blank. Um, we also want to know what the water surface looks like. That uh, helps us interpret, again, cyanobacteria conditions. If you're seeing white caps and a surface scum, um, that's probably only a very short period of time between before there will be no surface scum. So that information helps us interpret your data. Then comes the important uh, bloom intensity reading. Um, when you click the drop down menu, you will see the options that we presented to you uh, in part two. Uh, they include 1A, little to no cyanobacteria, 1B, uh, brown and turbid water, 1C, other material, other phenomena, and 1D, little uh, a small amount of cyanobacteria, and then of course, uh, category 2 for low alert, and category 3 for high alert. That information is very important. That's the whole reason you're, you're doing your monitoring, um, so that line is required. Then there's a couple of additional pieces of information that we need. Um, we'd like to know how far along the shoreline the bloom extends and how far out into the water, and your estimates are fine. Um, it doesn't have to be precise. It, uh, just estimate that as best you can. And then there's option at the, the last box at the bottom is an open text box where you can give us any additional details you would like to include. 
Remember that you should be uploading photographs anytime you suspect that you are seeing a cyanobacteria. Uh, for categories 1D, 2, and 3, we will be looking for those photos. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see uh, a location where you click to attach photos. When you do that, then your um, file system for your computer or your device will pop up and you can see where your photos are stored and labeled and then you can select them and you will see that they have attached here. Required fields are present. You can see that behind each of the names, several of them say required. Uh, the form will not upload if that information is not filled in. So if you have an A, you know, if you do try to click submit here later on and that information is not there, you will not be able to send your report in. So the bottom of the page allows you to select your location. Uh, if you type in your site number, your location should automatically show up in the map there. But we know that sometimes the pin is not in the place where you uh, made your report, so please feel free um, to relocate that pin. You should be able to drop and drag it to your correct location. At that point, you're done filling out the form. Click Submit Form at the bottom of the page. And again, um, if you did not fill in routine information, they are required and the form will not upload. You will get an error message. You'll just have to go back and see what you missed. Follow the same procedure for supplemental reports. Remember that supplemental reports um, are any extra reports that you take at your routine location. And this is different from last year. Those of you that are returning volunteers, remember that we had a second uh, link to go to if you were submitting a supplemental report. That link is not here anymore. This is how you submit your supplemental reports at your routine location. For reports that are not taken at your normal site, you use the second option to, to uh, upload your data. Submit a report at a non-routine location. You click there, uh, the form that appears looks very similar to the first one. Um, it does not ask you immediately for your reporting location, right, because this is a non-routine location. You'll fill out date and time. Uh, you'll fill out report type. Again, this is usually, this should be a supplemental. If it's not at your routine location, you are sending in a supplemental report. Um, so that is the first thing that, that is that automatically populates that line in the report. Move down through the form, provide your name, your affiliation, uh, the water conditions again, uh, the bloom intensity, same information about how far out into the water and how long along, how far along the shore. Then you'll see that there's an opportunity for you to suggest a name for your location. Please be pretty precise with that name. Um, on some lakes, there are multiple folks monitoring, and we want to make sure that uh, we keep our sites distinct, especially because we'll be using this data later, later and uh, we want to have a distinct location. Let us know what water body this is on, what town, uh, and how you got access to the site. And then at the very bottom, again, you can see there's a box that will allow you to put in extra information and a box that will allow you to attach photos. And you can see there the green box at the bottom. That's what it looks like when your photo is, is attached and ready to upload. Because this is not a routine location, you need to identify it for us. We want to make sure we understand from your name um, and this information where it's located. Uh, there is no site number to help you, so in this case you'll need to use the search in the, the search feature of the internet. Uh, you can put the lake name in, so you could put Lake Dunmore or, or Lake Iroquois here, um, but the more precise you are, the closer you'll of course get to that location on the lake. There's a pin dropped on, this, on the lake. Again, you can move it to wherever uh, it is that you saw the bloom. You can also in the search bar type in a nearby address and that will get you closer. Um, but if you just type in the lake name, it should get you there as well. Again, when you're done, um, submit the report by clicking on the blue box. If there are any of the required fields that you didn't fill in, you'll get an error message and be asked to go back and fill them in before you can submit that report. All of the reports are going to appear on the cyanobacteria cyanobacteria tracking map after they've been approved. Um, we have an approval process that I'll talk about in a minute. But the dots then on the map 
represent your report and they will be colored green for generally safe uh, all of the reports in category one yellow for low alert category two and red for high alert category three um, so you should see for every report you submit a colored dot on the map and also a line in the spreadsheet below please let us know later if you don't see it it does take us some time to uh, approve that report so you're not going to see instantaneous results on your dot will not be on the map five minutes after you uh, uploaded it unless one of us happens to be right there at the computer but if you don't see it within 24 hours and you know, if you go back the next morning and it's still not there please do let us know sometimes things get uh, funny in in computer land and reports uh, get stuck in limbo so please let us know so that we can figure out where it went um, and get that information in so we have a new look to the tracker uh, this year. It shows more of the state. We also have the, you know, it's a, it's a much broader view of the area that we're looking at. You'll notice also, if you look at the reports in the spreadsheet and follow the line of a report all the way over to the right, you'll see that there is now a column for attachments. This year, your photos will be available for everyone to view. Um, we, we, the New York Department of Health added, started adding their photos to their website last year, and we found it very useful. So when you submit a photograph as part of your reports, and you're submitting photographs for categories 1D, category 2, and category 3, those reports will be visible to the general public. Keep that in mind as you're taking your photos, and, and make sure that you're not putting uh, something up on the web that you don't want everyone to see. But it's great. It's very exciting. Um, I found by looking at the photos from the New York site that I also was learning cyanobacteria can manifest themselves in many, many ways. Uh, and many of you are seeing things that are not cyanobacteria but um, are of interest or, or of concern to the public. And so it's really great to have these photos available so everyone can see them. So I don't have too many troubleshooting tips. Um, as I said, this is new. The, the new interface this year hasn't given us a lot of time to find out, figure out how to break it. So we're leaving that up to you. Um, as always, if your device can't access the site or enter the data, please check to make sure that you've got the correct login credentials. Those of you that are returning uh, from last year, you will need new credentials for 2020. Uh, the information that you had for 2019 will not allow you access to the site. This is a security feature um, that the health department requires. So check your login credentials. You can try logging out of the site and logging in again. Sometimes if you restart your computer, you may try using another browser. I know that um, several of the programs that I use routinely require me to use a very specific browser. Some won't allow Microsoft Edge, some don't work with Chrome. So test it out. It may vary with what device, the device that you're using. Okay, so, so what's successful on your computer may not be successful on your phone. If the site that you are monitoring at does not appear in the drop-down menu on the regular report page, um, go ahead and use that non-routine report site and then let us know that you want to make that location a regular site and we will get it added um, to the drop-down menu and then you will be able to use the routine report page. If you can't save the report or you get that error message when you're trying to save the report, check to make sure that you filled it all the required boxes. And again, if you're experiencing difficulty and you have the option to take screenshots, um, please do so. Send us as much information. Uh, tell us what kind of computer you're using. Are you using a Mac? Are you using a PC? Are you using your phone? Um, tell us what browser you're using, um, and that will help us um, help the IT folks at the Department of Health figure out what might be going wrong. When all else fails, we do have two online options where you can send in your report. Uh, the Vermont DEC option is listed here. Uh, there is also an option on the, on the Lake Champlain Committee webpage for those of you that are working with the Lake Champlain Committee. Important for 2020. Uh, we're going to be sending everyone login credentials. As I mentioned, the Vermont Department of Health requires that you have new uh, passwords every year, so you'll be getting new login credentials. 
For those of you that are monitoring at sites that have not been monitored before, you will get site numbers and site names as well. Please don't forget to label your photos. Uh, again, it really helps us make use of them at the end of the year. And in 2020, we're starting monitoring slightly later than usual. Please start monitoring routinely the week of June 29th. That's the week that 4th of July uh, is in. If you see blooms before June 29th, please do let us know. You can email me directly. You can use the Vermont Department of Health Bloom Alert email. Let us know if you're seeing blooms, and we will get them onto the tracker beforehand, before June 29th. So what happens after you send in a report? As I mentioned, uh, we review each report for missing information, for spelling errors, that kind of thing that, that cause problems with our database. We may also call you for more information if we have uh, if we can't interpret your photos or we have some questions about what you're observing we'll give you a call we'll send you an email uh, to get that information we may also ask you to send in a sample um, but we'll we'll work with you at that point to make that happen and sending a sample may or may not hold up getting that report uh, onto the web page so once we've approved it um, it will go up to the map in the database. At that point, you will be able to see it as will anyone else looking at the website on the, uh, the CyanoTracker website. Vermont does have a law, Act 86, that requires the Vermont Department of Health to begin outreach of a bloom from potentially toxic cyanobacteria within an hour of confirming that that's indeed what it is. So as soon as that, that um, report hits the web page. The Vermont Department of Health is beginning to reach out to people. They contact beach managers, town health officers, drinking water facilities that may be in that area. Okay, we want to let everyone know that cyanobacteria have been seen and they should be paying attention and keeping an eye out. Signs are available to town health officers and they are the ones that are posting them. Um, they have the authority to close beaches and to make those kinds of determinations. So they are the ones that are posting signs. They may also decide to have water tested uh, for the cyanobacteria toxins. If so, the Department of Health will work with the, health, the town health officer to get those samples. Um, most of the time you do not need to help us. Uh, occasionally we may ask you to help get those samples, but in general that responsibility lies with the Vermont Department of Health and the town health officers. Please know, uh, I can't emphasize enough, every report is important. Uh, even if you don't see a single cyanobacteria over the course of the summer, that's information that we want to know. Uh, many of the locations in Vermont, many locations in Vermont are not monitored and we don't know what's happening there. So your report telling us that there's no cyanobacteria uh, uh, you know, on your lake all summer is really important and a good piece of information. We don't want to know just when blooms occur. And we love the weird stuff. Um, I learn by uh, the images that you're sending in and you help volunteers like yourself learn as well by sending in those images. If they're really unusual, um, we may ask you to send us a sample um, because you can only identify things so far from a photograph, so having a sample is helpful. If we do ask you for a sample, we'll work with you and explain, with, explain to you how to get it to us. These images here are from an unusual thing that was observed last year by uh, Lake Champlain Committee volunteers in the St. Albans area, and it was also observed later in the summer on Lake Memphamagog. Uh, a brownish scum accumulating at the surface, just like cyanobacteria, dispersing like cyanobacteria, but the wrong color, basically. Not the right color for pollen either. Um, when you looked, uh, took a jar test and looked at it, um, it did look a little bit like gliotrichia from the coloring, but the shape of the individual particles was definitely not gliotrichia. And you can see those uh, in the image on the right. They're kind of, they're kind of a weird kind of triangle uh, with a tail. It turned out that these are connected to zooplankton. Zooplankton lay uh, what are called resting eggs um, each year, and those eggs are released from the body of the zooplankton when it grows a new, uh, a new skin, if you will. They shed it a little bit like snakes shed their skin. And those eggs then float around and are distributed across the water uh, by the wind and the waves. 
in this case, there were so many eggs in one place that they formed uh, these scums at the surface uh, on Lake Champlain and, and also on Lake Memphremagog. So something about weather conditions, water conditions last year must have resulted in a lot of zooplankton uh, resting egg production. It's not something we see usually. So again, if you're seeing something weird, send us photos and we may ask you for samples. All right, so this is your opportunity now to put together the information that you've learned in, in part two and uh, do some categorizing of cyanobacteria images from the photos that you've provided for us over the years. These two photos here would both fall for sure into category two. There's a lot of particulate material in the water. There's a little bit accumulating at the surface. Certainly in photograph one, you can see that. The water in photograph two is a little, appears greenish, more greenish than in photograph one. Part of that is due to the lighting, but part of that may be also due to, there's a lot of small cyanobacteria in the water. In either case, if you were to, if this were happening along a shoreline, if you were to stand in the water, you wouldn't be able to see your knees and toes clearly. Um, and if this is in open water, um, there's a lot of, there's basically a, enough cyanobacteria in the water that we're concerned about it. This would be a category two low alert. Now it's borderline uh, in picture two in the photograph on the left. It's close to being a category three. What might make us decide to bump it up to that category is how far out in the water you see it. So if it's extending, these kinds of conditions are extending a long ways down the beach or quite a ways out into the water, then it probably is closer to a category three. We got a picture like this, we would be in contact with you asking those questions. Um, we would talk with you a little bit and help you make that determine, help, uh, help us make that determination between a two and a three. So these images show material gathered along the shoreline, uh, but it's not really that green. Okay, it's not the typical bluish green that you might be expecting when you see cyanobacteria. The image on the left has a little bit more of a yellow tinge to it. So what you'd be looking for are those additional signs on the, on the shore, uh, on material adjacent to the, the site. Um, you can look on tree, tree leaves, uh, Think maple leaves and things like that often. If this is pollen, you will find those deposits on leaves, on rocks, and other places, not just in the water. Look closely for the coloring. If it's more yellow, uh, it will be, it's more likely to be pollen, uh, excuse me, more likely to be pollen, but take that jar test because remember that gliotrichia has that kind of yellowish color too, and you may be seeing gliotrichia. The image on the white, as you can see, um, the monitor didn't was unsure what she was looking at, but that was white. Uh, when you see situations like this, take a look again for additional cues. It's raining in this photo, so it's not as easy to see what the rest of the water looks like. But at the base of the concrete ramp, you can see the water looks fairly greenish. Um, it looks like there may be additional material out past that floating piece of, of plants as well. And you'll see that there's some white foam, little flecks of white foam. This is probably uh, an old cyanobacteria bloom that broke apart in the sun um, and got pretty cooked. This is on Shelburne Pond, which frequently experiences cyanobacteria blooms. Uh, and so those are, those are the cues that would suggest to us that that is, again, the remnants of a cyanobacteria bloom. We'd give you a call, talk you through that, um, and then based on how much of this material you were seeing, we would decide whether this was a category two, which it clearly is, or maybe it rises to a category three. Okay, so this is a floating surface accumulation, but you can see that it's got a variety of colors in it. There's uh, areas that are more yellowish, uh, areas that appear to be more whitish. Um, it's a mixture. It definitely would be a category two. This is a cyanobacteria bloom, but it has mixed within it some pollen and a little bit uh, of pine, uh, excuse me, of uh, cottonwood fluff as well. It gives it that lighter coloration. So it is a category two. 
You can take your jar test. Um, you look at it. If you look more closely, you'll be able to see in the jar some of that the white fibers that were the uh, cottonwood fluff. You might be able to see the the yellow the yellow coloring of the pine pollen as well. This is a mixture, and again, because it's accumulating at the surface, there's a a large amount of cyanobacteria in one place. It would be a category two for sure. If it extended far out into the water or a ways down the beach, um, we may also ask you to give us some more information and then we might eventually decide that that is actually a category three. So the image on the left was taken on St. Albans Bay. You can see that there it's it's fairly wavy. There's there's some good water movement. And everywhere you look, the water is green. Very green. Sometimes sunlight can do that, uh, depending on where you are, the kind of lake you're on. Sometimes your water can look very green like that for reasons other than cyanobacteria. Take your jar test, confirm that you can see the particles, and that when they're in a quiet place, um, they are floating to the surface. Uh, in this case, it was a cyanobacteria bloom that was extensively distributed throughout the entire bay. This is a category three high alert situation um, for the entire bay, basically. The other image is that Rivularia uh, colony that was sent in to us from Lake Mori. It is a cyanobacteria. Um, it's a large concentration of cyanobacteria in a very small space, but if you see lots of these colonies, um, it can rise to the level of a category two. If you're only seeing one or two colonies, label that as a 1D, but if you're seeing lots of colonies, as I mentioned, uh, the long distance swimmers on Lake Mori were finding uh, colonies distributed throughout the lake. Um, that is at least a category two, and, a, um, and depending on how many colonies are out there, we may raise that also to a category three. Both of these images show uh, scums accumulating along the shoreline. You can see there's a slight difference in coloration between the two images. Again, sometimes that has to do with the lighting on the day that you're out on the beach. Take a closer look, do your jar test. What you'll find is that the image on the left is cyanobacteria. Um, it is accumulating slightly along the shoreline, but you can see it's really kind of a small accumulation. Um, and so this would be a category two. The image on the right extends quite a ways down the beach, it doesn't extend very far out, um, but it is extending along the beach, so it might fall into a category three. But when you look at this a little bit closer, you take your jar test or take a closer look, you'll find that this is duckweed. Okay, this is not cyanobacteria, this is duckweed. The darker material behind it on the shoreline is aquatic plant material that's washed up on the shore. Um, so this, even though it does look like a cyanobacteria bloom, would fall into category 1C, that uh, other phenomenon. The image on the left shows filamentous green algae that have come to the surface. Sometimes when the sunlight is just right and they're very happily photosynthesizing, they're releasing a lot of oxygen, and the oxygen becomes trapped in the mat, gives them a lighter color makes it look a little bit like um, cyanobacteria. Look closely at situations like this, confirm that you have a filamentous green algae. Um, be aware that sometimes cyanobacteria will get tangled in those filamentous green algae mats, so you do need to look closely. But in this case, this was filamentous green algae and it falls into category 1C. Photograph on the right is taken during an intense cyanobacteria bloom that was beginning to break down on a hot day. Um, you can see that right along the shoreline, you've got lots of white foam. Um, there's white foam and discolored material uh, in, in just out beyond that little ridge that's formed on the shore. A photograph like this is your close-up. It tells us very much that you have a cyanobacteria bloom, determining what level that it falls in, a category two or a category three, again, would depend on the extent. If it extends far out across your lake or down the shoreline, it could be a category three. And we may, uh, if you send only in a picture like this, we will be in contact with you to get that additional information to figure out what you're seeing. All right, so this is, this is an accumulation of something along the shoreline at the Coast Guard Station. It's kind of reddish in coloration. 
um, but if you look more closely, this is that cytonema, uh, that filamentous cyanobacteria that we found on Lake Champlain and are now seeing in other locations around the state. Um, you'll need to do this tick test here, um, and remember that this is not going to form the long stringy green hairs like filamentous green algae, um, and uh, you may also want to put it in a jar and leave it a little bit longer to see if the filaments migrate out of the mass. Uh, if, you, if they do, they will be that lovely blue-green color, and you'll be uh, able to confirm that this is a cyanobacteria bloom. And lastly, there are things out there that look like cyanobacteria that aren't. The image on the right is pine pollen, again, on Lake Champlain. Uh, today is uh, June 12th, and there are reports coming in already um, from Lake Champlain of pollen on, like, on the water. So do keep an eye out in June for, for pollen um, and make sure that you recognize it compared to cyanobacteria. The image on the left shows uh, benthic algae growing on rocks. Um, we get reports of this every year too. Folks are concerned that this might be cyanobacteria. In general, cyanobacteria do not attach firmly to the rocks um, like this. This occurs primarily in the springtime, but sometimes when water is calm and still and we haven't, there haven't been a lot of wind and waves. It's often filamentous green algae. It can be diatoms as well. Um, if we see something like this uh, and the coloring is interesting or, or you're starting to see material break loose and, and wash up on the shore, and we may ask you for a sample, but in general, this is going to be uh, falling into category 1C. All right, so that is the training for 2020. Um, at this point, if you're a new monitor uh, or a returning monitor that hasn't let me know, please tell me that you want to be a cyanobacteria monitor. Uh, send me an email. Identify the site where you're going to be monitoring. Uh, pick your day and time to monitor again so that, that you will be as unbiased as possible. And starting June 29th, you'll begin to observe the water weekly. Once you emailed me your site and confirm that you want to be a volunteer, I will work with the Department of Health to get you login credentials so that you can get into the site. And for those of you that took the trainings in, in June, I'm working on that now. No. And with that, we're done. Um, again, please let me know if you want to be a volunteer. Please also don't hesitate to contact uh, me, Angela Shambaugh, at the Vermont DEC or the Lake Champlain Committee if, if you're working with them. Whenever you have questions, we're here to help. Um, we're working with you uh, during the summer. Once you sign up um, and to become a volunteer, I'm going to provide your email also to the Lake Champlain Committee. They send out a weekly summary of what's happening to all volunteers. Uh, it includes photos of unique things that have been seen and information of interest to you to help you learn more about your lake and learn how uh, about appearances of cyanobacteria. You can always unsubscribe from that if you decide you don't want to receive it, but I, I will sign you up so that you have the opportunity to get it. And with that, happy monitoring starting the week of June 29th. Thanks again for being a volunteer, and uh, we appreciate your time.